Dear guests, let us welcome on stage Mr. Andrew Keene, Executive Director of the Silicon Valley Innovation Salon Futurecast and an acclaimed public speaker and writer, USA. Mr. Andrew Keene. Thank you. I could see you all down there, but I can't up here. So. There's something very... Uh, um, I don't mean to be uh, cliched, but there's something very Kafkaesque about this, some of these speeches. Um, the last guy said, you all, of course, know who Kafka is. Uh, I assume you do. Is this a local audience, or is this an international audience? International, maybe you don't. Well, if you don't, you should do. Um, so the, the last guy, waste management, I've never followed a waste management person, so uh, it's always a first time for everything. He said, citizens are part of the solution. And of course, he's entirely wrong. Citizens are the solution. That's what this is all about. Technology and government and the state. The world doesn't exist for technology. The world doesn't exist for government or the state or the public sphere or any of these other words. It's for us, the citizen. So let's remind ourselves of that. And of course, unfortunately, in, these, in this age of radical technological disruption, of enormous change, it's the quote-unquote citizens who are most vulnerable, often most punished. Um, it's nice to be in Slovakia. I've been in Bratislava a few times. I first came in 1978. The city certainly changed dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years because of political change, because of the revolution or series of revolutions against the state, building a new kind of state. Um, so the relationship uh, between politics and the public sphere and technology is always central. Uh, Slovakia was one of the countries in the 20th century that experienced a failure of the public sphere, the failure of a Soviet-imposed system that didn't work, that was inefficient, unjust, hateful, colonial, inefficient in every imaginable sense. And of course, it lasted 30 years or 40 years, however long it lasted, only because of military might. Um, so Slovakians know both the potential and the crisis of the public sphere. In 1989, when the peoples of Eastern Europe rose up against the Soviet Union, what they were concerned with was the reimagination, the rebuilding of the public sphere the idea of democracy, the notion of citizenship. A challenge, we're, we're in the castle place on top of the hill in a city of, in, in Bratislava. Um, throughout the history of, of human beings, we have invented or imagined castles and power and bureaucracy and public space, and we've always tried to legitimize them one way or the other sometimes successfully, sometimes less successfully. Kafka, of course, his most famous book was called The Castle, where he satirized a, a heartless and inefficient bureaucracy, a bureaucracy that didn't seem to have any logic. Um, you should think of The Castle in Kafka's terms, and perhaps even in terms of this building, as technology. Um, there's public space outside, uh, there was always public space, and throughout history, the relationship between technology and public space, the relationship between technology and the public sphere, has always been the great political issue. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The Greeks invented the notion of public space 3,000 years ago, and their version of democracy. And we've been tinkering, experimenting with this, over the last 300 year, 3,000 years. I'm not going to have enough time to give you a history lesson. But we're living through a time, again, of great change in terms of the relationship between technology and the public space. 
That's what conferences like this, when you peel away all the crap, all the technology, all the, all, all, all the sales talk, that's really what this is about. There's a new form of revolutionary technology. Blockchain, you hear it, you, 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 this is supposed to be a conference about blockchain, but as you understood, I, I've been here this afternoon, the relationship between blockchain, AI, and the Internet of Things is intimate. These things are bound up together. This is what Don Tapscott, perhaps the world's greatest authority and salesman of blockchain, calls the new Internet. And of course, this is a subject with enormous promise, a promise in which technology can reinvent the public space, a technology where citizens can be empowered, a technology where or a series of technologies where society can be made not only more efficient, but more just. That's what all these people are talking about, whether it's waste management or finance. It's all about reducing the inefficiencies and the injustices of the old 20th century state. And of course, as I suggested, there were many of them, particularly in Eastern Europe. Indeed, the state in Eastern Europe was, by definition, unjust and inefficient, uniquely so. Um, it's called the new internet. 30 years ago, I'm an I'm a entrepreneur from Silicon Valley. 30 years ago, we, we, we heard the same excited talk about the internet itself. It was supposed to radically democratize. It was supposed to empower. Everyone was going to share in all this information. We would see the appearance of a new kind of public space, the marriage of technology and politics would be an ideal one. The promise, of course, of the internet mostly hasn't been realized. Now, we know, of course, that the internet, you know, we, 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 we carry these supercomputers around with us. They define our lives. We couldn't live without Facebook. I could live without, I could live without Facebook because I'm not on it, but most of us couldn't. Certainly couldn't live without Google. We couldn't live without Amazon or e-commerce or many of the other dominant internet services. We couldn't live without texting or email. But the promise of the internet wasn't realized. The first chapter, if you like, the first experiment of the digital revolution is essentially an American one, defined by American companies, in which the public sphere was privatized. So we were promised democratic information, we were promised the public space of data, we were promised collaboration and community and all these other idealistic C words, and the reality, of course, is we've had a winner-take-all economy, a winner-take-all economy dominated by a tiny group of trillion-dollar, West, mostly West Coast companies. E-commerce is dominated by Amazon, social media is dominated by Facebook, search and the information economy is dominated by Google, the hardware business on the most part is either dominated by Google or Apple. What we've seen over the last 30 years is essentially, at least in the digital sphere, the disappearance of the public sphere. There is no public space. Zuckerberg promised the public space, he promised a replacement for the public sphere that green grass outside in the castle where people could congregate. But of course, it was a Facebook-controlled public space, a Facebook-controlled public space in which Facebook profited from its users and continues to profit from its users, a public space where we're all, exploited, where we're all exploited for our data, to use a rather vulgar term, raped, consciously or not. We've all become the product of what Shoshana Zuboff, very distinguished Harvard sociologist, calls surveillance capitalism. So what we've had over the last 30 years is the destruction of the public space, the disappearance, at least, of the public space in the digital sphere, and at the same, an enormously disruptive technological revolution changing every industry from driving to education to banking to media, even politics. And at the same time, we have a crisis of the public sphere. We have less and less trust in government, less and less faith in elected leaders. We have a, a kind of what 
One woman, Catherine Fieschi in London, calls the rise of a populocracy, of a system of political leaders built on direct democracy who reject the dominant elites, the traditional public powers of the 20th century, manifested, of course, particularly by Putin, by Trump, by Erdogan, by Bolsonaro, by Duarte, by Orban next door. Fortunately, Slovakia is one of the countries fighting successfully against populocracy. So we've had a crisis, or we have a crisis of politics, a crisis of trust, a crisis of political legitimacy at a time of enormous technological disruption, where every industry, every kind of identity is being transformed. It's the equivalent of the middle of the 19th century. The digital revolution is just as transformative, just as disruptive, just as exciting, just as dangerous as the industrial revolution. If you haven't seen anything yet, the revolution, the blockchain, AI revolution, the blockchain, AI, IoT revolution actually represents the second more significant chapter in the history of the internet. So when Taps got talks about blockchain being the new internet, he's right. He's right on many levels. And what's particularly true is that the stakes now are even higher. You remember the, the waste guy said, citizens are part of the solution. Citizens are the solution. Citizens are the thing in itself. That's all I care about, citizens. I don't care about the state. I don't care about techno tech companies. I want those tech companies, and I want the state to benefit the citizen, because that's why we have politics. That's why we have the public space. This new technology, of course, is, again, using all these buzzwords, a revolution of big data where every object becomes recorded, where you have a, a, a public space, um, uh, the, this unalterable ledger, the so-called blockchain, which can manage the data, where you have machine learning, machines, smarter and smarter machines that interpret this data. So we're on the verge of a profoundly different new age. One in which the public space and technology um, will create a truly 21st century world. Now, let me lay out three visions, three paths, three realities for this world when it comes to the public space, when it comes to democracy, when it comes to the way in which this new technology of blockchain and AI and I IoT is transforming the world. The first one, which is really a return to the 20th century, but a 20th century version of authoritarianism empowered with digital technology, is the one you heard earlier this afternoon, the, uh, the, 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 the social credit system, manufactured and engineered, and I use that word carefully, in China. Uh, I wish Kafka could have been here to hear that presentation about the social credit system, because what the Chinese are doing, a Chinese authoritarian regime, uh, more authoritarian, but also much more efficient, much friendlier to capitalism than the Soviet system of the 20th century, is use IoT, use blockchain, use smart machines to create an ever-increasingly efficient data dictatorship, one in which secrecy and privacy are destroyed, where the state rewards loyalty. You remember Orwell's 1984? There was a camera in everyone's house which was watching us. The reality, of course, of the Chinese social credit system is there isn't just a camera in the room. Everything from this cup to this stand to my clothes, perhaps even to my body, is embedded with chips that will watch me. This isn't surveillance capitalism, really. It's a kind of newly efficient surveillance regime, which is very attractive to many developing countries because it works. In my view, uh, my Chinese friends perhaps may disagree, in my view, this is 
a true nightmare. This is the worst kind of political system um, on offer. And it's uh, particularly troubling and chilling because the Chinese regime is extremely sophisticated in its use of technology and because the Chinese regime has engineered this synthesis of free market capitalism and political autocracy. But it's attractive to developing countries because it works in contrast say, to the old Soviet system that was really just a joke, as you Slovakians know. So that's the first model of uh, blockchain, IoT, blah, 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 this new technological world. The second model is the American model. The American model is one essentially, uh, I talked about the first version of the internet, the American model is one in which government is essentially irrelevant. In America, people look at Trump and they say, who is this guy? How can they possibly elect such an idiot? The reality, of course, I live in America, so I can say this, most Americans are idiots. Um, that was a joke. Um, the reality, of course, is that America is living in a world in which government has been subsumed by the entertainment economy. Politics, the state, the public space has become just another version of television, reality television, YouTube, uh, YouTube segments. And what you see in America, or the American model, is the destruction of the public space, the use of technology by trillion dollar companies to engineer social and political systems. So you have someone like Bill Gates reinventing the medical system. So you have Google and Facebook um, uh, pioneering uh, the discovery of new planets and re-engineering social systems. It's important, I think, to realize that the American system does away with the public sphere partly because of the history of the country, but partly because of the deep cynicism towards government, partly because of the dysfunctionality of government. The problem, of course, of the American system is, firstly, the public sphere is an attractive place. I like to meet people in the public sphere. I don't want pub private companies watching me and everything I'm doing. And, of course, the consequence of a privatized technological system is one in which secrecy and privacy is done away with. The state is marginalized. The state has no relevance. That's why these American companies have grown so large so quickly. That's why they're so unaccountable. And I'm not sure, whilst perhaps if Elizabeth Warren is elected president, which I somehow doubt, but I think that I'm somehow doubtful that things will change in America. So we have a third version, and that's the European version. There was a guy from Estonia up earlier. And I think what we need to do, the third version, the European version, is one in which technology and citizenship are synthesized. You have in Estonia, for example, I've written about this in some detail in my last book, How to Fix the Future. You have in Estonia an attempt through technologies like blockchain to re-engineer the relationship between the state and citizens. In one in which the social contract is re-architected so that the transparency lies on both sides. The transparency of data. In the Chinese case, the state knows everything and citizens know nothing. In the Amer if they are citizens. In the American case, the corporations know everything and the citizens know nothing. What you're seeing in countries like Estonia and indeed Finland, and ideally perhaps in Slovakia and other innovative countries, are ways in which data can be used because the beauty of blockchain is its transparency. But that transparency has to be shared. It can't be one way as it is in China, as it is in the United States. So what the Estonians are trying to do is architect this kind of mutual transparency where everyone knows everything that's going on all the time. That's a good thing as long as we know when we're being watched and as long as we know who's watching us. Blockchain is good because it does away with the corruption of government. It's great that we can watch government. 
But you don't want a system as in America where all the citizens watch government all the time and the government has no way of fighting back and the government loses more and more credibility. So at the beginning of this new revolution, the revolution of IoT and blockchain and AI above all else, Europe has an opportunity to forge ahead, to build a third way. The Chinese system is deeply troubling from a moral point of view, although it's efficient. The American system leads it, lends itself to a kind of libertarian anarchy where a tiny group of people become infinitely rich and everyone else is impoverished. The ball is in European hands now with blockchain. You've got to liberate yourself from the details. You've got to stand back. And we, and I say we, I'm, I have a British passport, but as I said, I live in the United States. You Europeans have an opportunity to shape a better world, just as you had an opportunity in the middle of the 19th century to shape a better industrial world after the failure of the first series of industrial revolutions. The, tech, the future won't be fixed with technology. Blockchain is not the solution. Blockchain is just an application, like this castle, like this cup like the computer I carry around in my pocket. It's not going to change anything. It's us as citizens displaying our agency, shaping a world we want. The stakes are incredibly high, because if we fail, the future is either China and America, both of which, in my opinion, are deeply unattractive. Thank you.